Uh, yes, everything sounds good. Okay, good deal. All right. Uh, well, thanks and welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to Zeke the Truth in the Cloud. Uh, my name is Adam Pumphrey. I am the Chief Operating Officer at Dynamite Analytics, colleague of Jamin's, a previous talker. And uh, shout out to Jamin for a great talk on Packet Total. Hope everybody will check it out. Um, quickly about me. Um, first of all, I'm a, a proud, proud husband and proud father. I've got uh, Cole, who's three, and Bo, who is 10 months. Uh, little boys at home, keeping me nice and busy. Hopefully you guys won't hear them uh, while I'm speaking here. Um, and in fact, I just ran downstairs and unplugged my garage door opener because like many of us, my home office is uh, adjacent to the garage. So hopefully you don't hear anything that sounds like a 747 landing on my house. Um, I've been working in cybersecurity for about 20 years. And for a large portion of that, I have, have had the pleasure of working with Zeke and I've been a long time, a uh, huge fan of Zeke. Um, specifically the Zeek scripting language and all of the, the cool and fun things that you're able to do with that. Um, had a lot of experience and, and a lot of opportunities to, to pursue some pretty unique use cases with Zeek script. Uh, this is actually my fourth time presenting at Zeek Week. So quick shout out and thank you to the leadership team and the selection committee and, and everyone involved in the conference, uh, putting the conference together, Amber in particular, uh, for giving me another shot. Uh, I love to learn, and hopefully everybody will agree that this, this conference is a great, great way to do that, and hopefully over the next 15 minutes or so, I can give a little, a little back here. So I'm coming to you live from Maryland with breaking news that cloud adoption is on the rise. Uh, of course, that is not breaking news, not profound at all. Cloud adoption has been uh, on the rise and, and continuing to increase for a long time, you know, like 10, 15 years, probably even longer than that. Uh, but recently it has seen a significant increase in adoption. Um, there is, has been a significant increase in adoption and that is because COVID as you probably uh, all would guess. Um, to quantify this a little bit, Forbes has uh, stated or reported that they estimate approximately 83% of company workloads will be in the cloud by the end of the year. Likewise, Gartner has also said that the infrastructure service market is expected to have grown by 38% in 2021, by the end of 2021. And Gartner also reports that uh, 60, the desktop as a service market will have grown by 68% by the end of the year. Um, that's a staggering number, it's kind of explosive growth, um, but probably not a huge surprise to all of us given that you know, working in sweatpants is kind of our, our new normal. So I mentioned a couple of cloud services uh, a second ago, um, infrastructure as a service and desktop as a service. But when I'm talking about cloud services or when we hear cloud services, what are we talking about? And I'm talking about these things. Um, now, if you don't know what you're looking at here, this is, this is actually a screenshot from the list of AWS services that are offered uh, you know, right through the AWS console. Uh, you know, what kind of strikes me funny about this list is that you know, if you look at the bold headings and uh, section headings here, um, they're kind of like career paths um, onto themselves. You know, that's, that's, you know, as you see compute, containerization, storage, databases, machine learning, all pretty expansive topics. And, and that's kind of crazy to me. That's, uh, you know, you can make a career out of any one of these subjects. And there's more, that, that, that's not it. The, the list goes on and on. In fact, there's, there's more that, that's cut off here that I just didn't include because you know, enough is enough here. Um, but thankfully, I'm not here to talk about all these things, just one line, uh, three letters, in fact, and that is virtual private cloud. So I'm sure everyone um, attending the conference today has some, some idea of what VPCs are. Um, but a quick breakdown of what they are, they're, they're kind of loosely synonymous with data centers. Um, uh, however, the network within that data center is defined in software, and that software interacts with a shared uh, physical infrastructure. We, the administrators, don't actually interact with the infrastructure directly. Uh, VPCs contain virtual machines or, or what are known as virtual instances, and those instances can really perform any function that a traditional server can. And you, you know, might argue that uh, they can actually do more in some cases. Uh, but from a monitoring perspective, there are some pretty significant uh, differences that I wanna highlight very quickly here. Uh, one is that there's no physical aggregation points to tap. So you're not going to be you know, uh, dropping an inline tap uh, on the uplink between the core router and the border firewall. 
There's also no uh, layer two switches to grab a span or a port mirror from. Uh, you just simply don't have access to that physical infrastructure, as I said. Um, there's also no firewalls or perimeters. You know, the boundary between your VPC and the public internet is really kind of a combination of network address, translation, uh, routing, and access control policies that are, you know, enforced by that shared infrastructure. And finally, the protocols and workloads can be very different in these environments. Um, you know, there's not a lot of user activity in these environments with the exception of desktop as a service. Um, and these environments are very dynamic, uh, elastic even, um, depending on capacity demands, hosts can come and go and they can appear and disappear in, in, in a matter of minutes. So while there are many differences between While there are many differences between um, uh, virtual private clouds and kind of traditional data centers, you know, they do have some things in common, in particular cyber threats and, and you know, the risk that they face. And if you haven't seen it, uh, the Cloud Security Alliance published what they called the Egregious 11 in 2020. Um, and this lists what they consider to be the top 11 um, uh, risks that are faced by cloud service providers and their customers. And later on, they actually went a step further and produced this uh, deep dive report that took a look at the egregious 11, or excuse me, took a look at a number of breach uh, case studies and tried to draw associations between these case studies and um, common controls and the egregious 11, the top 11 risks that they, uh, that they identified in this report. So I quickly want to talk about two of those breaches. The first one was Capital One. This was a server-side request forgery attack leveraged against a web application firewall server. In this attack, the attacker was able to query the instance metadata service, uh, which is, is kind of a magic API that's available uh, within the VPC environment for each instance and enumerate the IAM roles that this, this instance had access to. And when they're able to do that, they were used that, able to use that role to grab a temporary access token that they then took offline elsewhere, as I understand it, and listed and retrieved data from Capital One's S3 buckets, which led to a pretty significant data haul. Um, in their analysis of this breach, the CSA cited uh, protective and, and corrective mitigations that could have helped. And um, two of them in particular were, were focused on network better network visibility. The next attack was Imperva. And this is, is kind of similar, but a little bit different. Uh, this also involved an EC2 instance that was inadvertently exposed to the internet. That instance reportedly had some vulnerabilities and access to production databases. Uh, the bad guy was able to successfully exploit the vulnerabilities and then had access to the, the production database snapshots, excuse me, and was able to retrieve those snapshots, effectively giving them access to everything contained within the database. So again, in this case, uh, the CSA, among others, um, cited some, some recommendations that would have helped in detecting this breach and, and responding to this breach. In particular, um, you know, a spe special focus on uh, monitoring traffic between trusted and untrusted connections. So I did want to point out that the deep dive report contained several other um, case studies and several other mitigation recommendations. And, and clearly I've pulled out some examples that highlight the need for better traffic visibility in the cloud. Um, there, there are many, many ways to, to address these visibility gaps and detection gaps. Um, and I really don't think that there is like one specific right answer, but I argue that Zeek could have helped in these cases. And, and you might ask why, well, I'd say that Zeek gives you the data that you need to answer, ask and answer questions like the ones on the slide. You know, these are really just examples, not necessarily prudent for these, these breaches. Uh, but the point is what, what you know about a particular asset or an asset class, um, you can take that information and, and look at the data that Zeek provides and look for deviations from what you consider to be normal for those assets. And as, as demonstrated in the imperfect case, you could even use Zeek to kind of validate security controls, uh, security controls that you expect to be in place, things that you believe to be in place, um, you want to make sure that they're in place and, and performing um, as expected. And you know, just to, as an example, if you were to 
to uh, you know craft a scheduled search that looked for things uh, like that third bullet there. You know, if you ever had a result pop up in that in that search, then it's probably immediately actionable for the security team. So there's some other research out there. I'm not the only one beating the Zeke drum about uh, traffic visibility in the cloud. Um, gentleman by the name of Sean McElroy, um, SANS GX student, published this paper. Um, I guess it's part of his certification work. Um, and there's a link to it right there at the bottom, and I can post that in the chat later. Uh, but essentially, he uh, did this examination of different de techniques for detecting uh, server-side request forgery attacks, like the one that I mentioned in the Capital One breach. And in, in doing so, he crafted these simple signatures using Zeke's signature framework and was able to successfully detect the SSRF attack and was also able to you know, kind of demonstrate the same with Suricata. Um, now, this isn't the primary use case for Zeke's signature framework, as, as many of you have probably heard, um, but it's a really cool example of what can be done. And, you know, you could certainly expand on, on what Sean did here with these, these signatures um, into script land and, and go even further. Um, but one thing that I thought was kind of interesting about his work there was that Sean found that guard duty, which uses VPC flow logs, flow data, um, wasn't able to detect the SSRF tag itself. It was able to detect that, you know, the exfil credential was being used, or excuse me, the, the stolen credential was being used to exfil data, um, but it left several steps in that attack life cycle earlier in the, in the life cycle or in that kill chain kind of undetected. So it left a, a little bit of a, a visibility gap there. So at this point, you, um, if you're not familiar already, you might be wondering how, how can you get your hands on traffic in the cloud in a VPC environment? Well, you have a couple of different options, a few options available to you. First um, is kind of what is being, being referred to, I've heard referred to as a tunnel as a source. Um, and this is gonna come from an inline device, like a gateway, a proxy, a firewall, um, you know, any kind of third party vendor appliance that sits in line in the traffic flow. Um, these devices give you great visibility. Uh, these appliances uh, give you great and comprehensive network visibility. Um, but if, if that device wasn't already in line and you need this visibility, you might be faced with a situation where you need to add it. So you could be introducing complexity and potentially a, an additional point of failure in your architecture. Another option that you have is the software agent that'll actually run a little piece of software that'll run on the endpoint and capture packets from the interface and then kind of do the same thing forward that off to a packet broker or collector somewhere. This will give you great visibility from the endpoints perspective, um, but it does have kind of the, the, the side effect of additional resource overhead on the endpoint. And if that box were ever to get popped, you know, that's one of the things that an adversary is probably gonna go and, and try to disable. So it's kind of susceptible to that. And then finally, you have this new newer uh, option, which, is, which I'm calling traffic mirroring, and that's just kind of a generalization. Um, but what this does is kind of leverage this SDN, the software defined network itself as a traffic acquisition mechanism. Uh, this gives you great uh, comprehensive visibility. There's no additional endpoint overhead and you don't have to change your network architecture. So um, there, these uh, traffic mirroring services are available out there in the market. Um, the big three each have their own kind of version of this. Uh, Google Cloud has packet mirroring. Microsoft Azure has VTAP. Um, unfortunately, VTAP appears to be currently on hold, um, not, a, not available for general use, um, maybe allowing you know, technology partners to interact with it. I'm not really sure about that, but hopefully we'll see VTAP become available again in the not too distant future. And then Amazon um, AWS has its VPC traffic mirroring, where I just wanna focus uh, you know, for the next few minutes. So really quickly, how does VPC traffic mirroring work? Uh, well, it uses VXLAN, um, the virtual extensible local area network protocol, which is a tunneling protocol. And this all works with the, this, the traffic encapsulation and IP routing. Under the covers, there's what's known as a VTAP that establishes a VXLAN tunnel between a source and a target. And that source and target are actually specific elastic network interfaces or ENIs that belong to instances that you wanna monitor. It's, it's not such that you say, I wanna monitor all traffic from this host. Um, you get granular down to the interface level and that's how what are called sessions are configured. 
Um, traffic mirroring configurations are known as sessions and they have three primary components. One is a source, which is that the source ENI that I was just describing. The, then there's the target, which is the ENI that you want to send traffic to. And then there's the filter that describes the, the traffic coming and going out of that source interface that you are interested in mirroring. Um, you don't have to mirror it all. You can, you can do unidirectional traffic. You can limit the ports, uh, IP ranges, what have you. Um, you have some flexibility there. And I um, just want to point, point out there's a link down there at the bottom. That's actually to a document on Amazon's website that talks about using VPC traffic mirroring with open source tools like Zeek. So I encourage you to check that out if you're interested. A little bit more about VXLAN. Um, so I mentioned it's an encapsulation protocol and kind of what happens is um, the VTAP will add the VXLAN header uh, just above the, the original packet headers here and then also add uh, what are known as the outer headers. So you get a new UDP header, a new IP header, and a new ethernet header. Look at this a little closer. Um, you see the, the UDP header expanded here. I uh, just wanna point out that uh, the, the kind of the well-known reserve port for VXLAN is uh, UDP 4789. So you're gonna see that, that port um, a lot on, in VXLAN traffic. And then down here, you see the VXLAN header expanded. And um, you got a flags field, a group policy ID field, and a VNI or, or a virtual network identifier field. So um, you're probably wondering at this point, uh, if you don't know already, like what do I need to do if, if I really want to make take advantage of this and, and use Zeek to inspect traffic in a VPC using traffic mirroring? Well, the good news is you don't have to do a whole lot. And Zeek kind of has this cooked in. Um, in fact, it, the VXLAN analyzer is enabled by default. And if you want to check me on that, um, init-default init um, loads the tunnels framework, and then the tunnels framework actually loads the VXLAN analyzer um, in that little code snippet down there on the bottom left. So when Zeek receives VXLAN traffic, it does a couple of things. The first thing it's going to do is parse that, that outer header and the VXLAN header and record that in the tunnel log. So you're gonna see entries like the one on the left here that have the source IP source port, uh, the source IP of the, the source instance and the source port, and then the uh, RESP IP, excuse me, the origin RESP IP, uh, the RESP IP of the target and the uh, RESP port of 4789. So Zeek is gonna kind of decapsulate that, that encapsulated packet and then send the encapsulated packet back into the protocol analyzers like it would normally. And what you get by virtue of that is all the all the Zeek logs that you know and love. Um, you get the con log, you get all the protocol logs and everything else. Um, so, which is really nice. Uh, Zeek kind of handles that decapsulation for you and then expecting that you're gonna wanna reanalyze the encapsulated traffic, does that on your behalf, and you get the benefit of all the protocol analysis that it can do. Um, I do wanna point out that there is actually a linkage between these two in the form of the tunnel parents field. And that actually will include the UID from the tunnel.log entry that, that we showed you um, previously on the left there. So if you ever need to go from one to the other, you have that linkage available. So uh, we talked about uh, traffic mirroring. We've talked about VXLAN a little bit. I just wanna talk, touch really quickly on traffic mirroring deployment scenarios. And um, I want to point out a couple of scenarios. These are pretty straightforward, and I think uh, pretty do do a, a decent job of kind of breaking this down into understandable chunks. The first one is the one to one. You know, you simply have a source ENI, and you want to mirror it to a target, and that target is going to be an ENI on your Zeek sensor on your collector, and that's a one to one relationship, totally suitable for you know low bandwidth low bandwidth applications, and 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 kind of minimal workloads. The next one is the one-to-many scenario. And this is kind of the way that you're going to scale up um, beyond that the kind of one-to-one -one, uh, deployment situation. Um, maybe the, the source instance is, is pushing more or pushing and receiving more data. And you need to spread that out amongst a, a, a suite of collectors. Well, you can do that by defining a target ENI that belongs to a network load balancer. And that load balancer can then be configured to provision those 
packet feeds across this, this suite of Z collectors. The third scenario and third and final scenario is um, kind of a, a more of a many, many to many scenario. And that source, um, source in the session could actually be an interface on a, another uh, network load balancer, gateway proxy, Kubernetes pod, um, kind of a, an aggregation point, if you will, um, that's, that uses an ENI. And the target can then again be the uh, network load balancer interface on the network load balancer. Um, so that, that's going to then give you visibility into traffic to and from multiple instances on the left, and then the ability to provision and spread that load across uh, multiple Z collectors on the right. So um, having said all that, there are a couple of things that I think uh, you know, are, are important to know. Um, first, the VPC traffic mirroring leverages the VPC route table. So in order for this to all work, your IP routing in your VPC has to work. That source IP address needs to be able to communicate via IP to that target. Um, that, that, that routing is, is very important. Uh, second, the mirror traffic counts towards the source instances bandwidth utilization. Um, so you need to make sure that you size those instances appropriately. So you have a one gig link and you wanna be able to mirror uh, all of the traffic on that one gig link. Well, the instance needs to support a, a maximum bandwidth of two gigs per second. If that one gig link were to get fully saturated, you wanna be able to send it all if you need two gigs per second. Thirdly, uh, production traffic has priority in these environments. And you know, if you ever run into an environment where there's QoS in play, um, this probably sounds familiar and not surprising, probably what everybody would want. Um, so the simple point here is just make sure you don't oversubscribe and you won't lose any mirror traffic. Uh, the next point is that there is, like everything, a cost associated with using traffic mirroring. Um, in Amazon today, the cost is about uh, 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 one and a half cents there. Um, and just to give you a little context, that's going to cost you about 36 cents per day per interface. And if you say if you wanted to monitor uh, traffic on 10 interfaces for an entire week, you're looking at about $25. Um, so there is a cost associated with these things. So that's certainly worth knowing. And the last thing here, I just kind of thrown this out here in case... Uh, Somebody um, that's that's watching can can tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> Frankly, uh, TCP replay does not work um, across a, a VPC traffic mirror session as you would expect. Um, you know, just like uh, lots of us in this crowd, uh, I look to TCP replay frequently for testing and, and development and things. And I was kind of sad to see that it doesn't work in, in with VPC traffic mirroring. Um, there are ways around this. Um, you can use uh, traffic generators. You can certainly tra generate traffic yourself, um, but there, there are ways around it. But unfortunately, TCP replay today does not work as you might expect. So I think, unfortunately, I, I might be running a little bit over here. So I'm going to kind of rip through these things here at the end. Um, just want to highlight some of the benefits that you're going to get uh, from Zeeking in the cloud. Uh, first of all, hopefully it's well established and we've heard lots of great talks today and then the training yesterday. Uh, Zeke gives you unparalleled network protocol visibility. That's a point that can't really be understated. Um, it just, you, it's, it's hard to find anything else that's going to give you insights like Zeke does. Um, when it comes to traffic mirroring, you know, the nice thing about the, these mirroring policies is that if an if a instance were to get compromised, it can't be disabled. Um, the bad guy would have to get access to the AWS console in that example directly to disable the service. Um, and if that happens, then you are fully compromised and have very, very much bigger problems. Um, Zeek produces structured and consistent format. Uh, we all know and love uh, Zeek's TSV and, and, of course, the JSON format that it provides. Um, this, this lends itself greatly to ingest and other tools and analytics and and a bunch of fun stuff. Um, it's totally extensible. If you get into the scripting framework, it's kind of your, your imagination is, is the limit there. Um, the, the scripting framework or scripting language um, has been very good for a number of years and continues to evolve. And I'm thrilled to see that. So props to the, the Zeek team for, for continuing to, to build that out. Um, tons, of, tons of fun stuff that you can do there. Zeek logs support threat hunting and forensics. That's no surprise to anybody. And finally, 
you know, as I, I made the case about the Imperva uh, breach, I really think, uh, you know, I've used this my, myself in my own career, that Zeek can, can be very effective at helping you audit and validate security controls. And I would make the case that um, you, you could set up kind of searches or, um, or even you know, script policies, um, policy scripts that, you know, kind of seek to make sure that those controls are in place and working. And if they ever aren't, if, you know, you ever return results from that search, then that stuff is almost immediately actionable. Um, so it, it might be kind of an edge case, kind of an edge use case that is, um, but I, th I think it's still totally valid and, and pretty important. So I think that's uh, that wraps it up for me. Again, uh, my name is Adam Humphrey. If you want to reach out to me directly, there's my email address. And uh, thanks for everybody for watching. Uh, please check us out uh, on GitHub. We've got Dynamite NSM out there. And